No human can plan a battle to either attack or defend against your attack without AI, in particular reinforcement learning. So when I look at it as a computer scientist, I see this as the end state is RL, reinforcement learning, planning simultaneous defense and attacks on both sides, um, which optimize for outcomes. My own view, which may be naive, is that the average human, when, when they're faced that, when you and I were the, in such a situation, we would be so scared of what would happen because the outcomes are so unpredictable that it would serve as a deterrent for you and I yeah. to fight each other. So you're getting to something I covered the past. Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, talked in a conference about how armies are now planning of producing millions of drones operated by AI, and that will define the future of warfare. I know you're not applauding me. You're not applauding the press. You're applauding Eric, as you should. Uh, most of you know Eric Schmidt as the former uh, CEO of Google during its formative years, but he has done a lot since then. Recently wrote a book with Henry Kissinger. Uh, he has formed... Uh, an artificial intelligence think tank in Washington, D.C., very involved with artificial intelligence. He ad advises the Pentagon, consults with the Pentagon on military intelligence, and he has spent a lot of time in Ukraine, which, as everybody in here undoubtedly knows, is the site of the largest land war in Europe since World War II. So, Eric, tell us what is going on in Ukraine that we need to know. Well, the war is um, the most frightening thing you've ever seen. The death and destruction the number of people killed on both sides will just destroy your heart. And the first phase, of course, you know they, the Ukraine was not prepared for the war, which, for the record, was Russia invading it um, by force. The second phase was a, for, a period of essentially Ukraine getting stronger on the drone side and Russia getting its act together with respect to its, its tactics. The third phase was Russia actually pushing Ukraine back. Ukraine has recently, up till recently, been on a defense side and Russia on the offensive side. As of this week, they're much more balanced. Um, there's a, a, an assault that is just beginning now. It's a new one from Russia. It's called the Spring Offensive. It's around Prokhorsk. I've been there many times. Um, and we'll see. Good weather favors the drones because the drones operate best when you have higher ceilings. And the Ukraine numbers in drones, their goal for the year is to build 10 million drones. Now just think about that number, the vast majority of which are what are called FPV drones. They're not very sophisticated, um, but they're also using FPV drones. FPV is first person, first person view. It's an old racing term for drones. But the most interesting thing that they're doing is they're building much more sophisticated and integrated systems. So. One way to understand the war is uh, Ukraine started with no Air Force and no uh, Navy. They have managed to destroy the Russian Navy in the Black Sea uh, through these drone boats that you and I have talked about before. And they've essentially replaced the lack of an Air Force by drones. And they have a concept called that they call the concept of a drone line, which I think is sort of where we'll end up this year architecturally where there's high-level ISR drones. Uh, those are called the one... The ISR is Intelligence Surveillance That's Reconnaissance. It. And they basically are big birds with lots of, lots of endurance. They spend 12 hours floating around. They have very, very good cameras, and they're very well connected to bomber drones that then do whatever is needed. Um, the automation of that is the next phase of the war. And I think that, that all of that will occur this year. Some of the lessons, and I'll just summarize because we don't have very much time, I did not understand how important radio stuff was. It turns out that for many, many reasons, you have to communicate with these devices and you have to have visual confirmation. I figured that if you build drones, and it was, this was my advice, just build drones that can seek the target using AI and hit them, that would be good enough. It isn't, partly because humans want to see what they're doing for obvious reasons. More importantly, because the distances are involved, the targets move. And so a human wants to move, move to where the target is. The targeting is not perfect. But the most interesting thing is that Ukraine has a point system around reward systems for startups and so forth. And they compete on a point system where they have to show proof of kill. So for all of those reasons, the radio systems are the most important. When you start the war, remember there's no GPS and the Russians have the best electronic warfare in the world. They block everything. So a number of companies have figured out a way to use spread spectrum techniques and something called LoRa to build networks that allow you to see even through the Russian EW. Most American weapons don't make it through the GPS-denied EW, 
And that's a, sh that's a shame. The successful companies in the war are on a 24-7 basis. They are doing something during the day and in the evening they're reprogramming all the software. It's like a software company, but just un and unfortunately war is terrible in an actual war. But they work on a daily release cycle. As you know, the Pentagon procurement is a 10-year release cycle. So <laughs> the, gap is, the gap is enormous. What I want to say is that <clears throat> for those of you who think that Ukraine is losing, it's not true. It, a fair statement right now is that Russia is not winning and Ukraine is not losing. Now, this can change very, very quickly. And they are critically dependent on the Patriot missile systems for missile defense. One of the things that Ukraine doesn't have is very good anti-missile defense. I'm talking about ballistic missiles. So last week, for example, 49 ballistic missiles, of which four came out of, excuse me, 49 cruise missiles and 11 uh, ballistic missiles, four of which came from North Korea manufacturer, were landed on Kyiv. And there were roughly 20 or 30 people killed, a whole bunch of apartment complex blown up. Now just imagine, just put yourself in the mindset of this occurring in, in, in LA. I mean, it's very hard to understand what that would do to your own psyche, but this is normal for them. And it's horrific. Eric will be sharing his deep concern about the future of war and how scary it will be for us humans. Do you have the same concerns? Let's hear him out. So you're getting to something, I covered the Pentagon in the 1990s and I learned about the OODA loop for, if anybody knows that, observe, orient, decide, act. That is what we're talking about here is trying to shrink the, the so-called OODA loop, right? So you can see it and then react faster than the other guy using AI. Yeah, so the, 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 the US military is organized around the OODA loop, which is conveniently organized around human decision time. Yep. And most of the OODA loop work is three to five minutes. You know, you have time to think about it. You see it coming. You can sort of have a conversation. You can ask your commander, and then you can press the button. This, what is called the sensor to shooter time, is being reduced to a small number of seconds. Mm. The current rule in Ukraine is: if you see a drone above you, you are dead in three minutes. Um, I used to go to the front. I was bombed twice, which is never pleasant. Today, I can't go anywhere near it because the moment the drones see me, they will do it. Furthermore, the Russians have now moved their drones to well over Ukraine territory, and the Ru Ukrainians have moved their drones well over Russian territory. So the FLOT, as it's called, is actually the, the front line, which is the, the most forward, line. This is the forward line of troops? That's right. Uh, the actual DMZ, if you will, is at roughly 10 kilometers, but the space is now behind them. The so-called safe parts are now much wider. So what happens in the war is that distance, distance becomes important. Your drone has to go farther. You have to have better sensors and so forth. Here's the eventual state. T for thousands of years, we've had the notion of stereotypically a man and a gun fighting another man and a gun or with a horse or what have you. We're now breaking that connection forever because the war will be prosecuted over the internet in one form or another. And in the equivalent of Moscow and Kyiv, people will be drinking coffee while these wars are prosecuted. And the actual fight will occur above these things which are essentially robotic. This means, for example, that having a fighter jet with a human in it makes absolutely no sense. So all of a sudden, the logic of everything that we in our military do just doesn't make any sense, right? You should be building a, a tradable, Automa automated robotic systems for defense and offense. And the real scary part is the speed of how this tech is advancing right now and in front of our eyes. So would you describe uh, Ukraine as like the most advanced laboratory yeah. for modern warfare in the world? W yeah, and one of the things that I've learned about war, so I spent lots of time in the Pentagon, as I mentioned, uh, you, you did as well. I was there for what, nine years top secret clearance, all that, we would do all these war games. Well, they're very civil. Like, oh, you know, let's <laughs> think about this. That. It's not how real war works. <laughs> real war, the innovation cycle is three to six weeks. So the general rule in Ukraine is that if there's a Ukrainian innovation, it's adopted by the Russians within six weeks. Good example is the Russians had the old, model, the old Stalinist model of attack waves, and uh, Ukraine was doing a very good job of attacking them. Um, you, uh, Russia would put these uh, horrible situations where they'd have convicts and uh, the Wagner group. They had a group called the BioWaste group, who were people who were infected with HIV or H, um, Hep A, 
and they would put them on the front lines with no protection because they were expected to die. I mean, the, the level of cruelty is mind-boggling. So that model didn't work. And so Russia recently switched to rifle teams, which are much harder to detect. And the people building drones uh, in Ukraine is very interesting. I had always assumed that wars were tanks, right? Nobody uses tanks anymore. They're completely unsafe. A $5,000 drone can destroy a $5 million tank. By the way, the U.S. tanks cost $30 million. We'll ignore that. So the kill ratio, as, you d as they describe it, is 1,000 to 1 or higher. So it makes perfect sense, if you think about it, that you wouldn't, they, in fact, they don't use tanks or, AP or armed personnel couriers at all, except for one time every 12 hours, which is there's a very short window of 10 minutes between uh, sun basically sunshine and darkness where the thermal cameras aren't good enough and the visual cameras aren't good enough. Mm. And so what they, I'm serious, they rush during that very sh short window to shuttle somebody f inside or outside of the t tunnels. The people in the tunnels spend four days, that's the normal assignment, they have to be fed of course, and they're terrified because the, uh, the enemy, in this case the Russians, know, know where they are and so they're destroying them with KEB bombs. And so you sit there in your tunnel, boom, boom, waiting for yourself to die. So it's just miserable. So the, the, the future in terms of conflict is essentially the people are not going to be there, but the weapons will be very, very successful. I was speaking to one senior Pentagon person who said that one of the things they figured out is that the mass problem is going to get big. And I said, what is the mass problem? And he said, the mass problem is there's going to be so much weaponry above you, mm. right? literally kilograms of bad things, that it's sort of destabilizing in terms of... So what should we do to be prepared? What is the things that needs to change? Are we simply too slow? He has some ideas. Hmm. That's am amazing about the tanks and the per armored personnel carriers because it was like less than two years ago that it was such a big deal. It, it was so difficult just to get them Abrams tanks and Bradley uh, APCs. Yeah. And, and we, now we, have, we have 5,000 tan Abrams tanks, uh, I believe, in Germany sitting in warehouses. Yep. Uh, give them to someone else. <laughs> okay. I, I'm serious uh, that we just don't need them. And, and if you look at the current budget proposal, uh, the president and the Pentagon are buying more of all the things that they don't need. What they should do, just being very blunt, is study this war, and then America needs to dominate this future. Yeah. Right? This, we, you know, as, as you and I have talked about, I've written a lot about innovation agenda. America is good at innovation. Why are we not innovating into this space? Okay, so uh, in last October in Foreign Affairs, you wrote an article with, uh, with uh, Mark Milley, former yeah. chairman of the Joint Chiefs, America isn't ready for the wars of the future, and they're already here. That would be the war in Ukraine, among others, I'm sure. Um, well, we've got five minutes, uh, uh, Eric. You can tell us how to fix the U.S. military. <laughs> I was talking to one president of the United States, and I said, I don't understand why you can't fix this. Can you say which one? No. And he said, no one can. Um, uh, we've organized our, mil our military into a uh, – first, the humans are great but it's run like a bad 1980s corporation. It doesn't have a coherent goal. It has 435 board members who have special interests. It's not possible to cancel anything, so forth and so on. From my perspective, the Pentagon does not think the way software people think because they don't know how to hire them. They get rid of them. Whenever they hire software people, the, uh, the accounting people can't figure out what they do because software people you can't figure out what they're doing, and so they eliminate them. Um, so it's just a bad culture with respect to how they do procurement. The typical new weapon cycle is about 16 years, and that's from start to finish. Now, do you think that we can accurately predict the weapons that we're going to need in 16 years from today, given the level of innovation that I'm describing? Of course we can't. So there are technology approaches within the, the Pentagon. One are called using OTAs, and there's special What's authority. An OTA? uh, it's essentially a different kind of uh, authorization to, uh, to buy outside the procurement process. But the procurement process is now do dominated in the following. Um, there's a two-year process of studying. Then there's a two-year process of writing an award. Then there's a two-year process of developing the award, selecting to one vendor. That one vendor then develops for three to four years. After that, they deliver the product, during which time they're held up for a year or two by challenges between the different primes who sue each other all the time. This is not a good recipe for innovation. Right? 
there's the good news is in Amer in America you've now seen enormous number of startups and they are innovating in the space that I'm describing they're incredibly good we have one right here you'll hear right in, in a, actually a whole That's bunch what's coming next. but I, I certainly know I certainly know about one of them and I've worked with them a bit um, and their problem is that the customer is not ready because the customer says that's great, but the startup is moving at startup speed and the government is moving at startup speed. Now, thank God we're not at a war. I was talking to one of my favorite general friends and he said, don't worry, Eric. If it's a real war, all the rules go away and you can get anything you want. Eric is advocating for national security and urges for new ways to achieve it. Listen to it. Do you see any any uh, area within the Pentagon? I mean, there it's it's not literally monolithic. Um, the Marines, for example, the Marine Corps is you could argue is somewhat more innovative, less tied to big uh, weapons platforms. Is are, are there any small hubs of innovation that are happening faster? Relative to the innovation that is needed and the kind that you see in Silicon Valley, there's no one in the hunt. There are very small teams in the various militaries that try really hard. There have been special, uh, something called AFWorks and so forth. Each of the services has them. But they're not spending very much of their time or emphasis on it because the incentives do not reward this kind of innovation. And um, you know, to me, it looks like business as usual. And I'll give you a simple rule. Um, do you really think that we're going to defend Taiwan with all of our aircraft carriers? Let me remind you that we have no particularly good defenses against hypersonic missiles. Nobody has. It's a very hard problem. Um, and those aircraft carriers used to be hard to find, but now they're easy to find because everybody has these LEO constellations or surveillance. Do you really think that China's not going to take a land to sea approach and get rid of your missiles? So imagine the, the aircraft carrier that it basically says, well, in 30 seconds you're going to be dead. Press the button. So the person says, talks to the boss and says, I'm pressing the button, they press the button, but there's no effective defense against these kind of weapons. Um, a simple solution, which again, I, I don't know that we're pursuing, is instead of doing that, build basically um, things as you see with the Maduro boats in, in, uh, uh, in Ukraine, where they're on the water, but they can sink even a few feet below the, uh, the water and then serve as the equivalent of torpedoes. Now, what I would do, right, um, is build those things uh, and think about it. I mean, I don't run a company in this space, but uh, I would build those boats, get the military to purchase them, and then stage them such that it would in, uh, not allow for a land invasion by China of Taiwan, take away one of their options. It's easy, because, you know, you, they are called row row boats, and the way you, sorry, R-O-R-O, -O -R -O, roll on, roll off, and you basically go from China, it's about 100, China to Taiwan is about 100 miles, Right, you, you stop that interdiction. You stop the, the alleged or future um, embargo of the fuel and energy sources of Taiwan. So the point is when you start thinking my way, you just come up with completely different platforms. And we as a nation are not doing that. And I'm a strong advocate, again, working with Silicon Valley, working with the companies you're gonna hear about next, right, to see that future. It's how we're gonna stay safe there's plenty of money for national security in America, which is great, right? It needs to go there. I wish we could listen to Ukraine stories and more of this. Uh, we're out of time, no, but that thank was you fascinating. All. And you can look that up, article up, uh, uh, Foreign Affairs, last October, Eric Schmidt and Mark Milley. Thank you. Thank Eric. you so much, Rick. Okay, thank you all.